the concepts of property and land ownership, or just ownership in general, were things, uh, other things, on which the American Indians and the European colonists would not be on the same page. Now, Europeans would frequently say that Indians had no concept of personal property or of property in any way, and they would use that as justification for taking their land away because, you know, the Indians didn't view themselves as owning it, so how can you be taking it away from them? Um, that's not entirely accurate, uh, although, well, it gets a little complicated, okay? So, first let me say that Native peoples did have a concept of personal property. For example, let's say that you were a Cherokee man and you spent, you spent all day making a new bow and some arrows and you uh, had them sitting in your, in your house, in your uh, uh, domicile, and you stepped out for a minute and someone just walked in and took your, your new bow and arrows that you just made and wandered off with them and claimed them for their own. Well, you're going to be upset because someone just stole your stuff. That was your personal property. You made it. So it's not as though Native people had no idea of anybody owning anything. But they did not have the idea that, that the dirt under your feet could be claimed by someone as something that was owned. Any more than they would have uh, been able to comprehend the idea of the air and the sky being owned or of water being owned rivers being owned now that doesn't mean they didn't have territories they did they had areas in which they operated uh, areas in which they would have their their villages maybe different related villages different uh, different bands and they would have areas where they would do their traditional hunting but they didn't view uh, that they owned those things. They viewed that they had the right to use them. And sometimes, in fact, it wasn't uncommon at all, if there were, you know, several tribes in a region, and they were tribes that were allied and got along together, they might all use the same areas. You know, they didn't have it marked off, here's an invisible line, or here's a property marker, and you can't go past that. They didn't have that idea at all. And when it came even to their villages and their crops, they had a different view of it than Europeans did. For one thing, we're talking about tribal people. What is a tribe? A tribe is a group of people that uh, are of the same descent. They're, they're related, maybe distantly related, but you've got... You have the family unit, and families are in clans, and clans uh, are uh, sometimes in bands. There are bands and villages, and those make up tribes or parts of tribes, divisions of tribes that make up whole tribes that make up, and so on and so forth. Um, but if you've got, again, let's, let's go with the Cherokees here. If there's a Cherokee town, and you just happen to wander in there and you see this town, you'll see that there's a big cornfield, huge cornfield in that town. And it doesn't belong to anyone in particular, uh, nor does anyone in particular have the exclusive right to use it. It is the community cornfield. And actually, this is the way things were done all throughout the American South and the Northeast and the Midwest and the Southwest, every place that there was agriculture, which was most places. So the uh, community would work in that field. So among the, uh, among the Cherokees, everybody would take turns or would all work together in the cornfield. Now, each family might also have a small garden out behind their house for their personal needs for other uh, stuff, non-staples, right? But everyone works in the cornfield. When, um, when the corn is harvested, then it's divided up among all the families, and each one gets 
roughly what it is estimated their family, based on the family size, will need over the course of the winter. And with what's left over from that corn crop, some of it, among the Cherokees, would be put in a storage building. And that storage building would also be community property, so that if your family had miscalculated on how much you were going to need to get you through the winter, or if the winter wound up being harder than expected, then you could just come in and take what you need. And so could everybody else. Uh, so part of it was uh, given over to that purpose, and then what was left over after that was burned. It was sacrificed in this ceremony that was really, it was the people's way of showing the Creator that they had, uh, they had faith and they were only taking what they needed and relied on you know, the spirits to, to give them anything extra. In fact, among the Cherokees, one of the names for the Creator Spirit is the Great Apportioner, who gives everyone their fair portion. Now, when Europeans witnessed this, it just freaked them out, because this is incredibly wasteful. How are you ever going to get ahead in life if you don't accumulate as much as possible? But that's not how, that's not how the, the native people looked at it. Now, over in the uh, coastal northwest, the Pacific Northwest, there was a, a specific ceremony that was called a potlatch. And that was the English kind of transliteration of, of a word that meant uh, giving away. And a potlatch, that is where, when a prominent family, and remember I said that they're in the uh, Pacific Northwest, those societies were very tightly structured, much less democratized than most of the other uh, tribes in the other regions. But a very prominent family, when they would have a special event, when some member of the family would advance a rank in social standing, for example, or just about anything else, they would host this big party and everybody in the village would come to this party and there would be dancing and there would be ceremonies, uh, rituals carried out, uh, and there would be all kinds of uh, like food and, and things like that. And then the family hosting it, and sometimes two or three families might go in together to host one, would give away all their stuff. It's like... Uh, it's like a yard sale, except you put everything out there and you don't get any quarters for any of it. Uh, so people just come in and take what they want and they leave and you don't have anything left. And yet you're very prominent. You're even more prominent now because you gain honor. You gain standing in the community. And this is true throughout most of the tribes of North America, not just in the Pacific Northwest, you gain honor, status, and standing not by how much you accumulate, but by how much you give away. So, you know, families hosting a potlatch, you give away everything, uh, so they gain more honor and more standing uh, and are more highly regarded. Plus, you know, eh, next week or week after, someone else will have a potlatch and you can get some stuff back. So this is a way in which you can have personal property but never get to attach to it because it is fluid. Because even though it's in use by you as your personal goods, it really is the property of the whole community. And that is a whole different way of thinking than what Europeans were used to. I mean, both the United States and Canada uh, because these, uh, these tribes extended all the way up the, uh, the western coast of Canada, outlawed these things when they took over and, and made these into reservations because it was just, it was unchristian, they, they felt, not to accumulate wealth, but rather to give everything away, which tells me they weren't reading too closely uh, in the, uh, you know, the, the Gospels. But anyway, uh, that's, that's one other big difference. Another big difference, gender and family dynamics. Now first, let's talk about family dynamics in the sense of how it is determined 
your line is traced and the membership of clans and etc and tribes are measured about one-fourth about 25 percent roughly of north american tribes were patrilineal which is also what europeans were and uh, in fact what uh, uh, most uh, not only uh, european but uh, asian cultures were patrilineal your descent is traced through your father um, about 25 percent of tribes did that now that's uh most of the Suyan tribes, that includes the, the Lakota, but other groups as well. Most of the tribes in California, and most of the tribes that lived like the Lakota on the Great Plains. The majority of tribes, though, about three quarters, or around 75% of them, were matrilineal. Which is to say that your descent was traced through your mother, not your father. Uh, your clan membership, your tribal membership, depended on who your mother was. And that, that was just weird to Europeans, who were used to women having very much a uh, secondary or tertiary or quaternary behind the livestock sometimes position in families. In those tribes that were matrilineal, which was most of them, women had quite a bit of, uh, of social leverage and power. And in the tribes that were patrilineal, in many of them as well, women had an exalted uh, status compared to European women. So that seemed kind of strange. It was also just kind of hard to figure out in general. So, again, these are tribal members, and everything is based on kinship. So either you're a member of the family or the tribe, or you're not. So let's say that a white man married a Cherokee woman and they had children. The uh, white man's white relatives and friends would call that child probably a mixed blood or a half-breed, which is a very insulting term, by the way. Don't use that term. Um, because that's how they would view it. Only half-white. The Cherokees would view that child as Cherokee because the child's mother is Cherokee. So, child's Cherokee, right? Um, this would, uh, for example, uh, lead to some some confusion when trying to look uh, for imagery. For example, the, uh, when the French met the Choctaws in Mississippi, Louisiana, around in there, mostly Mississippi, um, and they were dealing with the Choctaws. They, they, they met with the Choctaw leaders and gave them gifts and told the uh, Choctaw representatives, these gifts, they said, come from your great white father across the sea. Now, the French, being European, assumed that it would just be understood by the Indians that if I'm giving you this gift and it comes from your father across the sea, you're accepting it is accepting an obligation because now you are indebted to an authority figure, a paternalistic authority figure. So accepting those gifts to the French meant those Indians were uh, submitting to a more powerful authority. But the Choctaws are matrilineal. And in a matrilineal society, your father is not the one who disciplines you. Your father is usually not even the one who teaches you uh, the things you need to know. Uh, if, you are a, if you're a daughter, your mother does. If you're a son, then your authority figure and, and your um, mentor is not your father. It is your uncle, your mother's oldest brother. And if your mother doesn't have any brothers, then it is your maternal grandfather. Your father, technically, he may live in the house, but technically he's not even related to you. 
because he's not in your clan. Um, and if you're from different tribes, well, he's not in your, your tribe even. So the father's job, uh, from that point of view, was actually not to tell kids what to do, but, you know, to kind of hang out and play with them and give them presents. That's their job. So uh, the French were expecting one thing. The Choctaws were hearing something else. Oh, great, gifts. Thank you very much. We'll be on our way doing whatever the heck we want to now. And that's how it worked. If the French perhaps had understood the family dynamics and used, you know, the illustration of this is from your great maternal uncle across the sea, the Choctaws, although they still might not have listened, would have at least, you know, gotten a clearer sense of what the French were trying to say to them. Now, um, what I said is true. Uh, you're either in the tribe or you're not. You're either in the clan or you're not. And in matrilineal societies, it all comes down to the mother. Now, most tribes in the American South were matrilineal. Shawnees were one exception. They kind of migrated down from Ohio. Um, so to, to understand this better, let's just say <clears throat> we won't use Cherokees this time. We'll use Creek, Muscogee Creek Indians. Let's say that you are a Muscogee Creek um, man and you've got um, two sisters. Now, let's say that some white guy uh, living on the coast uh, comes inland and he's tired of living in those uh, English colony cities and you know abiding by English law and he would rather live a freer existence and he also wants to trade with you so maybe he comes he he comes to your village and he marries your sister well he's married your sister so uh, um, any children that they have are going to be Creek Indians now, let's say that also there's an African slave held on a plantation along the coast that escapes, makes his way inland, and comes to your village. Now, particularly uh, in the, uh, uh, the, the, the lower Creek areas, it was very common for the Creek Indians to accept runaway slaves into their tribes and into their families. So let's say this, this black guy marries your other sister. And then they have children. Those children also are Creek. They're not mixed. They're not half this and half that. There's no such thing. Now, if that white man or that black man were adopted into the tribe by a family that officially sponsored them and said, we're adopting this person, then they would become full members equal to anybody else. And whereas a European might come in and see you and your two brothers-in-law and see a white guy, a black guy, and a red guy. All the Indians are going to see three Creek Indians who happen to look differently from one another. Well, guess what? That is really, really different from how Europeans are going to look at it. Another difference is that whether we're talking matrilineal or patrilineal, there was this sense of a gendered division of labor. Men had their sphere, women had their sphere. Now, that may not sound that different from European culture. On the surface, you know, Europeans at this time period believed that, uh, well, men are in charge, men are the masters, men are the owners, women, uh, men are supposed to be out working in the fields, and, and doing other things, doing the work outside. Women are supposed to be inside the house, taking care of the house. That's the, uh, that was the traditional European view at, at this time. But women might have their role in the house, but do women really make the decisions? Not really. Um, women were, well, literally were property. Uh, if you go far enough back, you know, that's why the father gives away the bride to the new groom and her last name traditionally changes because she no longer belongs to the father. She now belongs to the new groom, right? So even in patrilineal Indian tribes, men and women may have had separate roles, 
But those roles were much more equal. And here's how those roles worked, particularly um, among matrilineal tribes, especially in the eastern woodlands, but kind of generally across the board, although not completely. But here's, here's how they generally worked. So men do the hunting and men go to war. Men, therefore, are responsible for what happens outside the village. Women do all the farming. Women essentially are taking care of everything that goes on inside the village. Now, those communal cornfields, no one owns them. They are really the... It's, it's the community property, right? So it's the tribe, it's the village. But if anyone could be said to have more authority and more sway over what got done with those crops, it was the women, because that was the women's job. Men take care of outside the village, women take care of inside the village, and it's both roughly equal. You could also look at it that men are responsible for shedding blood and taking life. And women who shed their own blood once a month are responsible for giving life, both through childbirth and through agriculture. So, um, well, we'll talk a little bit more about this when we talk about uh, um, captivity and stuff like that. But generally speaking, men... If men go to war, they go on a raid, they, met, they capture some, some enemies, they get to decide whether to kill them or not, or to bring them home to the village. But once they bring them home to the village, the men would have no further authority over what happens to those captives. The decisions about the fate of those captives would be made, once they're inside the village, by the women. Now, when Europeans saw this, they saw the men off hunting, fishing, uh, and, and going to war, and the women doing all the labor in the fields, all the agriculture. The way Europeans looked at that, because for Europeans, where land ownership, back in England especially, land ownership uh, was something that wasn't available to everybody. It was only the well-to-do uh, people. And so the uh, <clears throat> excuse me, the uh, poorer men had to work in the fields for the richer men, right? Uh, so the richer men were then able to just pass their time hunting foxes or whatever, um, just kind of living a life of leisure. So the Europeans that showed up in the New World viewed those male Indians who were always off hunting or doing stuff with the guys as a bunch of lazy bums. They're just off having fun and entertaining themselves instead of doing the labor in the fields like men are supposed to do, supposed to do because by golly, that's what God said in Genesis. Um, and they force their women to do all the hard work and they just make slaves out of their women, just drudgery, and it's oppressive. But from the point of view of the women, um, they would be insulted if the men came and started working in the fields because that's their job, that's their responsibility, and that's where they hold sway. So that's going to be some, some major misunderstandings as well. And one other thing when it comes to gender, and by golly, if this doesn't freak out the Europeans, I don't know what will. Sexuality, in which I don't just mean... Um, is it permissible to have extramarital or premarital sex? It depended on the tribe. Some tribes had very strict codes of behavior. Some tribes were a little more open-minded about how people behaved sexually. I'm talking about the fact that among many tribes, not all, but among many, especially in the Great Plains for some reason, um... There was a view that even though everything's divided between male and female so far as spheres of influence, there are, there's a range, there's a continuum. Um, people could be born male, but identify as female, 
or vice versa. And that's okay. And everyone in the village, everyone in the tribe would accept that and just accept that as the natural order of things. And some tribes had uh, extra genders. Sometimes they had more than one extra gender. Um, that's something that Europeans are, are, are really going to, uh, well, be very, very cruel in their description of. They're not, you know, we're talking about, you know, like 17th, 18th century English and French and Spanish people. They're not that open-minded. Um, and it's going to also lead to a lot of, uh, lot of friction. Now, among... Like I said, among many tribes, it's, it's accepted, not universally, but among some tribes, it's not only accepted, but if, well, let's, let's take, for example, the Lakota, the Lakota Sioux, uh, who live in the northern plains. Among the Lakota, there was a name for um, that sort of uh, person, now a more modern term that uh, is uh, associated with Native Americans in this phenomenon is two-spirit. Um, this is not something that every culture had that term. Uh, among the Lakotas, the term was winkte. So a person who was a winkte, that was a, essentially a woman in a man's body, or vice versa, was not only accepted, they, if you had one in your family, you were considered to be really, really lucky. You were blessed, because those are special people. And they even have special powers, special powers of counseling, special powers of interceding with the spirit world, special powers um, uh, of uh, uh, persuasion. Now, there was a story. By the way, the, the photograph here is uh, from an individual from the Zuni tribe. That's a Puebloan people living in uh, Arizona, New Mexico, named Weihua, born with male parts, but identifying as a woman. Uh, the, the, uh, the Zuni word is Lamana for that, uh, uh, that type of person. And was, you know, it was accepted. Everyone was like, that's fine. If you were born with boy parts and it's time to go to war uh, and, and, and you want to stay home with the girls um, because that's how you identify, no one's going to make fun of you. No one's going to be mean to you. They're going to just, you know, all right then. And in some, in some cases, in some tribes, if you were, you know, born with girl parts and it's time to go off to war and you want to, you know, you want to get yourself some weapons and go ride along, um, that was okay too. Uh, several tribes had a, uh, a tradition of warrior women uh, and women living as men in some cases. Now, there was one incident on the Crow Reservation in Montana in the late 1800s, where there was an individual uh, who was, you know, what, what we're talking about, someone who had been born uh, with male parts, but identified as a woman, and therefore the whole tribe viewed her as a woman. And everybody viewed her that way until the government took over and made it a reservation and they had government agents running the thing. Government agents freaked out. Uh, and the, uh, the guy who was the administrator of the reservation came to the Crow chief's home and told him, ordered him to do something about this crazy guy that dresses like a woman, make him cut his hair and dress right and act right. And initially the chief responded by threatening to kill him, uh, threatening to kill the government agent and chasing him away. But they realized they couldn't keep that up. So what ultimately wound up happening is that different families took turns hiding this individual uh, whenever the uh, reservation agents were coming around so that she could continue to live as she identified uh, and as the rest of the tribe viewed her. Um, that's miles and, and, and centuries ahead of the viewpoint of the, uh, the European colonists and their descendants.